Greetings, I'm Neil Bakovin. Good to be back with you for my third video series. Today I'll be talking about cannibalism in our human past. Not a subject that comes up every day around the kitchen table for, uh, for good reasons, but an intriguing, revealing, and disturbing part of our human nature from the very beginning. Of all the horrible and shocking things that human beings can do to one another, nothing alarms, disgusts, terrifies, or fascinates us as much as cannibalism. The subject is intriguing in part because it is so complex. What causes people to eat other people? Well, researchers have come up with a bunch of categories of cannibalism, with probably the most common ones being survival, aggressive, and ritual. Survival cannibalism is mostly necrophagy, eating the dead so as not to waste their calories or to make it through famines. Aggressive cannibalism is more about hunting and eating your own species because it's easy or you've developed a taste for it. Ritual cannibalism is complicated, and in many cases, it is related to religion. However, a lot of it centers around honoring loved ones or keeping their essence nearby. On the other hand, ritual cannibalism can stem from wanting to insult your enemy or to assume their strength, courage, or some other good quality that they had. As author of The People Eaters, a novel about Neanderthal cannibalism, I get this question a lot. Were Neanderthals really cannibals? Well, the short answer is, yeah, a fair percentage of them were. One of my heroes, the renowned paleogeneticist and recent Nobel Prize winner, Svante Pabo, has stated that human bones with cut marks or percussion breakage to extract marrow are, in his words, typical of many, even most, sites where Neanderthal bones are found. Most of you remember that Pabo is the man responsible for sequencing the first full genome of a Neanderthal back in 2010. That same year, he also sequenced the genome of a human the world knew nothing about and he thereby introduced us to Denisovans. By the way, Svante has a very interesting background. He was the illegitimate son of another Nobel Prize winner. Well, Neanderthals certainly weren't alone in their cannibalism. Homo sapiens had their own rich history of it, and we'll get into that very shortly. As this location map indicates, Strong evidence of Paleolithic to Bronze Age cannibalism has been found in at least 18 widely dispersed archaeological sites in Europe. Neanderthal and older cannibalism accounts for half of those, including several that I'll talk more about in detail. Goyette in Belgium, El Sidron in Spain, and Krapina in Croatia. I'll also be giving some detail on Goes Cave in the UK, where we Homo sapiens practiced cannibalism. Krapina in Croatia is the site with the largest collection of separate Neanderthal remains, and most researchers agree that portions of more than 80 individuals have been found there. The bones indicate that Neanderthals, to paraphrase philosopher Thomas Hobbes, had lives that were nasty, brutish, and short. The typical age of death was between 14 and 24. Most of the remains show evidence of periodic malnutrition, famine, and or disease. Many of the individuals had been butchered, cooked, and eaten. Sometimes it is hard to tell between cannibalism and other defleshing, which might have been done for rituals, odor control, or other purposes. But when human remains show patterns of cut marks, scorching, percussion breakage, and other fractures like what we find on non-human 
final remains, most will agree that represents cannibalism. For instance, cut marks on Neanderthal bones at Goyette Cave in Belgium are virtually identical to those found on prey animals which have been processed for their meat. The percentage of human remains receiving such treatment is also important. At Goyette and El Sidron and several other sites, more than 30% of the human remains show thorough carcass processing like skinning, evisceration, disarticulation, and defleshing. All the breakage and cut marks and where they occur on the bones strongly suggest the pursuit of food rather than ritual cannibalism where more often only select parts having a cultural significance like the heart for bravery were eaten. Perhaps the saddest case is that of the Neanderthal remains recently found at El Cidron Cave in Spain. There, about 43,000 years ago, 13 members of a clan, including men, women, and children, were eaten. The bones indicate intense nutritional stress from a diet of moss and mushrooms. The overall evidence, including cranial trauma, has convinced many researchers that the cannibalism was aggressive by another group for survival or predation, not just one group eating its own dead. Life doesn't get a whole lot worse than that. Starving on moss and mushrooms, then being killed and eaten by your neighbors. Nasty, brutish, and short. The El Cidron bones also feature at least 17 birth defects probably the result of inbreeding. So you can add deformed in that life doesn't get much worse statement. The defects indicate low population densities for Neanderthals of the time, or at least low social cohesion. It's a pretty good guess that if you know the folks north of you are cannibals and you're not sure about those to the south, then you probably keep more to yourself and that insularity would only serve to increase the chances of inbreeding. Going farther back in the fossil record, the 600,000-year-old Bodo cranium from Ethiopia, which is, by the way, the type specimen for Homo bodoensis, it was clearly defleshed and probably eaten. That's a long time ago, but there are at least two older cases. The oldest evidence of probable human cannibalism was discovered just a few days ago. I had to revise this discussion. Clear evidence of defleshing and probable cannibalism has been documented on a 1.45 million year old human bone that was found by Mary Leakey in Kenya way back in 1970, and it was recently restudied. Since it's only a shin bone, we can't tell which human species it was, but the time frame fits very well with Homo erectus. This discovery pushed the earliest probable human cannibalism a half a million years farther back in time from the 900,000 year old remains found at Grandolina Cave in the Sierra Atapuerca of Spain, which used to hold the record. At Atapuerca, members of the Homo antecessor species likely hunted and killed and certainly ate at least seven members of their own kind. As a side note, Homo antecessor used to be considered the ancestor to both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, but recent studies of dental proteins suggest that's probably not the case. Instead, Homo antecessor is likely a close sister lineage to the ancestor of modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans for that matter. A recent study by Rodriguez and his team has documented that the cannibalized Homo antecessor bones at Atapuerca show the distinctive cut marks and percussion breakage for the marrow similar to nine other mammal prey species among whose bones 
the human remains were discarded. Studies have shown that humans have a somewhat lower caloric benefit than other potential prey types. A human body has about 125,000 total calories, which sounds like a lot, but it would feed a group of 25 males for less than a day. Compare that with a bison, which provides more than 600,000 calories, or a mammoth, which gives 3.6 million. Horses were a common prey for humans during the Paleolithic, and a single horse could provide the same calories as six humans. So why did Homo antecessor target their own species? The Rodriguez study modeled caloric returns versus the cost of acquisition, and their results suggest humans were a preferred choice over some of the more dangerous beasts based on an ancient cost-benefit analysis by Paleolithic minds of the time. That result paired nicely with another study that showed the percentage of non-human prey types and remains at Adpuerca matched their likely abundance in the environment, whereas the percentage of human remains were dramatically overrepresented. The bottom line is that these archaic humans apparently like the ease of hunting their own species. It's obvious that cannibalism generally hurts and destabilizes populations, but it does give advantages to the cannibal. Those include, of course, getting the nutrition, but also eliminating potential competitors and reducing vulnerability to attacks, cannibalistic or otherwise. The negatives of cannibalism are mostly related to reducing the chances for reproduction by eliminating potential mates. Cannibalism does seem to increase in tandem with population densities, so on a broader scale, cannibalism can have some beneficial effects by regulating population size. More indirectly, cannibalism generally increases when prey populations are low, so that can help buffer or stabilize predator and prey population densities. So as you can see, there's been a lot of complex research devoted to this subject. In the next episode, we'll focus the microscope on ourselves and take a closer look at the evidence of cannibalism among Homo sapiens. Besides Paleolithic examples, we'll even examine more recent ones. That'll even include the infamous Donner Party in 1874 and the Uruguayan flight that crashed in the Andes in 1972. You don't want to miss it. Until then, bon appetit.